Thank you all.
Thank you. Good morning. I assume that's exactly how you expected this morning would start. Um, I'm going to very jealously say that all that applause just now was for me. Therefore, can we please have a proper round of applause for these musicians? Thank you all. Weeks and weeks and weeks, they worked and worked in blood and sweat to learn that music. And by that, I mean an hour last night. So <laughs> needless to say, they are amazing. Um, so I am Austin Wintry, and I'm a little bit of an unusual type for a conference like this. So you're probably wondering, what is a composer doing in a conference that uh, specializes in, obviously, you know, policy, discussion, economics, liberty, business? Um, actually, you're probably wondering more sort of foundationally, who the hell am I? So, uh, hi, I'm me. This is me. Here's uh, who I am, attempting to look very fancy. This is uh, more realistically uh, how I am, awkward and uh, sort of, you know, trying to pass off something charismatic and utterly failing. I come from Los Angeles, so stereotype legally obligates me to show you a photo of me with somebody famous. <laughs> the reality is, the short answer is I'm a composer. I work in all smatterings of areas. I do games, film, TV, theater, basically anyone that'll have me, case in point, being at FeeCon. Um, and my work has been nominated for seven British Academy Awards. I won two of them. Uh, my colleagues at the American Society of Composers and Lyricists uh, uh, gave me video game score of the year two times in a row, and a different set of colleagues in the Game Audio Network Guild have uh, given me a total of 26 nominations in their so-called gang awards, among them 11 wins in categories like music of the year, composition of the year. Uh, my music has charted on the Billboard charts, and I received the first ever Grammy nomination for a video game score. And with all of that, no, no, with all of that laid down, you're still wondering why I'm here. Because here's the thing, what does everything I just said mean? Jack shit. <laughs> Literally nothing, especially when facing this, the blank page, does not care at all anything that happened yesterday. It's just as merciless and terrifying, uh, no matter what uh, nice things people have, have done for me. Uh, so if that, awards and whatever else, as grateful as I am, if they mean nothing, and if they're pointed at my music, and, and I'm not really here to talk necessarily specifically about music, raises the question, what am I here to talk about? Um, I think it leads to a question of how exactly do I get jobs? I'm still wondering that, uh, but we're going to try to walk through it. That leads to a question more sort of foundationally of what is it that I sell? And that's sort of the question I want all of us to think about. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean in some uh, business sense, although I have a feeling that's going to be a theme amongst everyone here. Um, so I want to give first a rudimentary explanation of how my field, particularly the world of video games, everything that you saw in the montage, the medley, was all, that was all video games. Probably very obvious, but now we're all on the same page. So let me explain how games work. I think a lot of people have this perception that it's all very Tron-like, uh, that this is what it looks like to design a game. Sometimes it actually is accurate. Usually it looks a lot more like this for hours and hours and hours at a time, uh, followed by extended periods of this. <laughs> and when you're really lucky, you end up looking like this, um, at least on a good day. In reality, it's actually it's a really complex field. It's also a very technical field with incredible uh, technical sort of art and creativity. And I want to talk a little bit about one of the games that I worked on, featured just now in the little medley. This is a game called Journey. Often, as a composer, I'm brought in pretty early in the process. It's different in films where you're brought in often at the 11th hour when everybody's freaking out and panicked and they've run out of money and everything has kind of gone to hell. It's like, welcome to the team. Um, in games, the, the, the tendency tends to bring in composers a little bit earlier than that. Um, and in the case of a game like Journey, I was actually brought in from the beginning. So spent fully three years working on this game. Um, 
For those unfamiliar, it's a game where the player is this solitary character, that one, uh, a sort of nameless, identityless, ageless, genderless, cultureless avatar that is designed really so that you could kind of project whatever identity you know, of yourself basically uh, onto. Um, the environment is mostly this kind of desert. I know that I, I, in my haste, I picked an excellent high resolution image to showcase the game, but that's a desert with a kind of mountain in the distance. It's meant to be a kind of hostile feeling environment, key being feeling, because the game actually has no challenges. It's, it's not a hard game. It's very un-video gamey when you think of the traditional game mechanics where you get frustrated and you have to try to get better and better and better. This is not a skill-based game at all, but there nonetheless wanted to be this implication of a kind of dire circumstance, and deserts have a good way of making us feel that way. Um, in other words, it's about time spent in the world, not really skills mastered navigating the world. Um, and all of that, as you would probably imagine, impacts heavily how I conceive of the music. On a technical level, um, it's evolving in a very dynamic and real-time way around how the player navigates that world. So, you know, for example, as the player approaches certain milestones, and sometimes it's as innocuous as like that sand dune or something that they wouldn't necessarily perceive as anything noteworthy. Nonetheless, I've worked with the programmers and the engineers so that, you know, as they approach it, the music can crescendo and it can build energy and rhythm and all that sort of thing. And then they peak, you know, the mountain is revealed and then the music gently comes down. And all of this is being done in some cases algorithmically or in some cases through a lot of kind of like working behind the machines like this desperate monkey uh, to stitch it all together so that the player has this very seamless experience. Another core component of Journey is that it's actually a multiplayer game, uh, again, with the high-res imagery, uh, but you can connect with another player who is also very kind of um, identity neutral and explore this world together. And your only way of communicating is through a, a sort of chirping mechanic where you hit one of the little buttons on the controller and a little burst of light comes out of your character and there's a whole kind of implied language. And all of this is heavily impacting what I'm doing. In fact, some of the design decisions, because I'm working in parallel with the whole team, evolve based around the music. In fact, there was one uh, kind of funny, semi-noteworthy moment while working on the score where they showed me a very, very rough mock-up with unfinished graphics and bugs and it would crash half the time and all that, because remember, this is software. Um, and they said, here's what we want this to be, and they described something very emotional and very kind of stirring. So I wrote this piece of music based around what I was imagining the final product would look like, and then I remember uh, they put that music in the game, and then they said, they, they looked at sort of what they thought was gonna be the final version of that scene, and it just was so ridiculous, and the music was scoring this dramatic epic, and it felt like it was basically a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I said, I ought to reel that back, and they said, actually, no, we should make the game fit what you did because this emotion is actually really awesome and really sort of powerful and the game is falling flat. To be clear, that's kind of a rare conversation. Normally it's all the composer's fault and we have to go and reevaluate what we're doing, but this was a really special experience, um, but also not wildly different from the way a lot of the game industry works. Um, so, as I said, uh, it's a multiplayer game, and the music is bearing that in mind in a technical way as well, because things like your literal proximity to the other player is constantly remixing the music and changing how it sounds so that you would have a very different musical and therefore emotional experience playing the game if you find someone out in the world or if you never do. Uh, because I didn't mention before that the way the multiplayer mechanic works is that you'll just be wandering along and then someone just appears because the system is scanning who uh, in the world is playing the game. Here's two players that are in proximity each other, to each other, so it just connects them. Uh, so in other words, if you wanted to sit down on the couch and play with your friend, you're out of luck. You have to literally have two separate PlayStations and you can't even force them to connect. The whole idea is kind of a blind matchmaking and the underlying goal of that is to create a game where we learn to empathize with each other and we learn to connect with each other in this just very sort of uh, uncontrolled, unmitigated way. So I write all the music, I spent, you know, in this case, years and years doing it. Then the uh, final step is to actually go and record the various instruments and produce it and make a final result. Here's me with last year's keynote uh, speaker at FeeCon, Tina Guo, whose cello solos form the core. This is a photo of us almost 10 years ago looking just barely not infants, and uh, 
And uh, so the, uh, the Captain Morgans uh, is often an important part of the creative process as well. Um, and so we go and we record soloists, uh, we record an orchestra. I realize this orchestra is actually serving as a kind of live proxy to the one behind their heads in the photo. But uh, that's also relatively common. Sometimes people think that video games all still sound like Tetris. Uh, and uh, it's actually pretty common to record orchestras in case that's of novel information to anybody here. Um, so, needless to say, this takes a lot of uh, flexibility, it takes a lot of patience, it takes certainly creativity, and uh, it might create the impression that that's sort of what I do and therefore what I sell. I wanna give you a little demonstration of exactly the power of how this works. I gave the musicians basically no warning I was going to do this, so if this goes to hell, you can blame me. Uh, if we would, in the intro, bar 29. So, we all see movies, hopefully, especially after today, we all play video games. Yes, yes, good, I'm seeing total consensus. And, Something that even despite our general cultural literacy with these forms, we don't necessarily appreciate or, or, or realize is just how much the music manipulates what you see and what you hear. So, if you would give me bar 29. Here is the world's most generic sentence. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy brown dog. Isn't this a noble sentiment I'm communicating, right? Okay, thank you. Now for our round two that I explained. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy brown dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I might have cheated with a little bit of alteration of my performance, but you'll see it's obviously very simple and very idea that the moment the music starts to turn a little darker, what was one moment ago noble and, and, and beautiful uh, becomes ominous and dark and, and creepy, and that's basically what I do for a living, is figuring out what does the subtext need to be, what am I trying to say? Um, so maybe that is what I sell. It's this package of understanding that, this notion of, uh, this combination of my training, my experience, et cetera. But I actually don't think uh, that's what it is, and especially I don't think that's when I have opportunities why I'm getting them. So I'm gonna kind of approach this a little circuitously uh, because I have often found myself facing a, a kind of a dilemma, an, a, an esoteric one, but nonetheless. The dilemma is what do I care about most? The art itself, meaning sort of music and storytelling through music, uh, do I care about that or my career prospects? So I know it's kind of an odd sounding dilemma, but this is where I think the notions of entrepreneurship and the free market really come to bear, which I guess that is sort of why I'm here. The manner with which this dilemma tends to manifest is at uh, professional conferences not unlike this, which we have loads of in the game industry, or even something as simple as like a Facebook exchange where somebody reaches out, often a composer, kind of early in their career, just getting started, and they, they ask me for simple advice. Sometimes it's technical advice, sometimes it's musical advice, or, or even legal advice, which I strongly disencourage uh, them listening to me from, or about, and uh, uh, creative advice, uh, whatever that case. Now, I could have the attitude that, you know, to hell with you, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and uh, I am either going to ignore your request for advice or Perhaps more insidiously, I'm going to give you deliberately horrible and sabotaging advice, or maybe even just useless advice. Um, but this kind of defensive approach is predicated on the idea that I don't actually believe in my own creative potential, my own sort of creative power. It's a belief that one day this, the, the well that I have to draw from every day is gonna, is gonna dry up. Um, and it's also built on this sort of implication that helping my colleagues comes to the detriment of my own career and that somehow I'm only as good or as valuable as that advice that I might give out. Uh, but as in most things in life, it's plainly obvious that this is not zero sum. So it's a, sort of a ludicrous conclusion to draw. So obviously I don't think that's true. Uh, but secondly, 
In my case, at least so far, I'm lucky enough to say that inspiration has actually always felt kind of easy, and I think the main reason for that is that I actually really, really love games, and I love film, and I love television, and all the areas in which I work. So when I sit down to write one, it's usually just a flood of inspiration because the medium itself is so inspiring. And the biggest stress that I have is figuring out what in the hell to sort of take out of the equation, which ideas are coming to mind turn out to actually be other, utter horseshit, and which ones are actually really good. That's far more stressful than just staring paralyzed at the, the blank page. And using one example, I did a game called Abzu. And I mean, even just looking at one frame of this, I can't, I can't not start writing music. I just thought uh, the game is so exceptionally beautiful, and not just visually, the way it feels in your hands. So everything about it just starts speaking to me, and I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, stop or slow down. So in this case, uh, much like Journey and a bunch of others, I thought, okay, I can imagine something grand, something sort of beautiful and, and fluid, not trying to be literal with the underwater setting of the game, but it has a certain uh, constant motion, so I found myself going an orchestral route, but I also thought, you know what I love is harp, and then being the ludicrous person that I am, I said, actually, you know what would be awesome is seven harps, and uh, lucky enough to be able to make that happen. Uh, and also, uh, we had a large choir and all sorts of weird bells and lots of electronics and all that sort of thing. So as you can see, inspiration is not really the problem, and therefore I could never justify a refusal to share ideas on the basis that I'm going to somehow run out on my own. Uh, let me give you another example, a, a different game I worked on called The Banner Saga. Funny enough, this one is kind of a perfect proxy to a lot of the themes of this conference because it's basically a game about sort of scarcity. And it's uh, a game in which you play a sort of caravan of Viking-inspired. It's all done in this beautiful hand-drawn Ivan Durrell, if you're familiar with the uh, great American painter. Um, the, the whole aesthetic of the game is kind of a love letter to his style and everything is, is quite literally drawn by hand in this sort of 1960s Disney uh, aesthetic, which I just fell in absolute love with. But also the notion of the story and this idea of people being out kind of on the raggedy edge of civilization just trying to get by. As it turns out, I also had a very limited budget. So this notion of scraping by on peanuts spoke very directly to my own just pragmatic considerations of how the hell to pull this off. I knew I wanted something very kind of potentially cold and stark and without a lot of the traditional warmth you might hear in a soundtrack, which led me to the idea of what if I recorded a wind ensemble? I can make a kind of something that can feel very cold but also very large, and all the warmth you get from strings uh, is just not in the equation. It's a little hard to tell, but there's no strings in that orchestra. Well, it turns out there's usually like 50 strings, and so by getting rid of them, you save quite a lot of money. Notice there's none up here either. So. Uh, that uh, turned out to address everything. It addressed the budgetary constraints and the creative uh, constraints. Um, another thing that I might add is that game music, game scoring, the video game industry, like most industries, is very fluid and dynamic where aesthetics and tastes are always changing. And so a solution to a dramatic problem that I have on Monday that I throw out might turn out to be really valuable Tuesday, and I think that's a really cool thing. So it's entirely possible that you don't even need all new ideas all the time. Sometimes reevaluating things you previously thought were garbage and dusting them off, uh, you might find new value and new meaning. What's more, one of the things that I find so uh, entrancing about it is that it's, it's more than just the notes on the page. It's actually about the creative exchange of minds. It's about people collaborating and finding all of these solutions that I'm talking about together. So everything that I've talked about on these previous games that I worked on didn't happen in a vacuum of me just telling the game developers, here is what I'm going to do. It was me working with them so that we could concoct you know, our music for our game instead of my music in their game. And that collaboration and partnership ends up being everything. And I think it's probably, hopefully, what the people who hire me like best about the sort of reflections afterward uh, on, on why they hired me, the, the question of, of what was it like to actually work together. So then circling back to this question of what it is that I'm selling, it's less of a product and more of a process. So it's not so much what I do, but how I do it. And uh, so that could very well be the thing that I'm selling. And obviously, it's not how in some technical sense, like I'm going to approach it X, Y, Z way with the software or with the musicians or whatever. It's the, it's the how of the connection amongst fellow minds. So going back to my little dilemma, if, if uh, I found myself at this crossroad of like, should I be helping these people? Well, how can I even, how could I lose 
creative exchange? How could I ever be usurped or have stolen from me the idea of just the person-to-person -person interaction? Um, now, obviously, there are industries out in the world that do sell widgets, and I don't, I'm not one of those, but uh, I understand that there is traditional needs for kind of defensive mechanisms in place to protect people's uh, property and that sort of thing, and, and, uh, but I'm saying that the takeaway might be that that's never just it. I mean, obviously, you only need to think about things like customer service to realize that the process is at least as important, and in my case, I think it's probably everything. But let's say for a moment that I actually did run out of ideas one day, and then I did just stop getting opportunities to work. Um, there I find myself kind of at that dilemma again, where I have to decide, okay, well, do I care about the art of music, or do I care just about hanging on to my career for dear life, because it would look in that situation like it's careening off a cliff and about to all end in a spectacular disaster. Um, but I think it's obviously still a false dichotomy. In a world of uh, free markets and constantly improving solutions, there's no reason that uh, the notion of creativity wouldn't also be one of those things that's continuously evolving and, and getting better. And I have to accept the idea that I might not always have the best idea and that my solutions won't be the most satisfying to the potential collaborators, which means I need to be okay with the fact that if I actually love this art itself, that uh, one day they might stop hiring me and go after some of my colleagues instead and I get to watch from afar and enjoy the fruits of their labors as an observer. But actually the truth of the matter is, I think that's okay. Because if I'm not offering something unique or compelling, then I, it's ridiculous to try to jealously hang on to it because what in the hell am I actually hanging on to? And if I do have something compelling to offer, then the art benefits from trying to share that maximally. Because the whole reason I became a composer was out of a love for this art. It wasn't sort of entrepreneurship first found something I was reasonably good at and then just went after it. It was, what do I love? What do I think I'm good at? Hey, okay, now how do I try to earn a living there? Um, and so it's astonishing how often opportunities come about when you actually stop worrying about obsessing over opportunities. It took me a long time to learn that. Never mind also a golden rule that everyone here is gonna understand is that competition pretty much always makes things better. <laughs> Um, and in a meta way, I think of competition as an industry-wide collaboration to improve the art itself. We're always one-upping each other and finding more interesting solutions and new musical ideas and all that sort of thing. And this is not a platitude. This is not something that just sounds cool on a Hallmark card. I think it's important to live this principle on a daily basis. The art form that falls stagnant is one that not only stops exciting me as a consumer, but one which would actually make my job harder to do. I would have a harder time getting jobs if suddenly everything was kind of becoming stale and boring. So in other words, a climate in which artistry and creativity is generally declining uh, is one in which risks start becoming shunned and the aesthetic and taste becomes increasingly conservative and narrow, and that's not something I really want to participate in. Uh, which leads me to a kind of side point that I think all entrepreneurship and everything, creativity in general, is an outgrowth of how you live your life. An open mind and a general curiosity about what you know, may lie under a rock in front of you, combined with this sort of generous spirit of bolstering up everyone around you, I think is not just a way that I build my business, but it's the way that I just want to be, you know, it's just how I want to live. It's just the kind of person that I want to be. Um, so learning to take risks as an offshoot of that isn't just something that I think we need to do, um, and bear in mind, I don't mean stupid risks just entirely for their own sake, but learning to make risks where the risk itself is actually something beautiful. And like any other muscle, this is something that has to be practiced and worked at, and you get better at it the more you go. Uh, obviously, we live in a world where scarcity versus abundance is a constant uh, reality and a constant discussion, and we're always looking for ways to allocate resources for maximum effectiveness. And that kind of creates this dichotomy where just philosophically you have to ask yourself, do I want to live in a world where I think in terms of abundance and I'm therefore embracing constant opportunity and there's never a fear of that running away, or a world in which I let scarcity rule all my thoughts and my main MO becomes about avoiding risk. Obviously, I think that's kind of a false dichotomy. I'm into those today. Uh, one can easily find abundance in every sense through the pursuit of risk. The embrace of scarcity 
generates abundance, as counterintuitive as that is for most people, although I think probably not to this crowd, um, but I have a good story to illustrate that. So when I did this game that I was speaking about, Journey, one of the things that happened is the game was met with incredible, uh, it had an incredible reception. It got a lot of praise right out of the gate. Reviews were very good, and the user reaction was very good. And one thing that happened was everyone took my soundtrack album and immediately started putting it up on YouTube. Uh, so that's, it might be a little hard to see here, but that's just some random person's upload of the music. And you might be like, pirates, damn thieves. Um, but I was actually flattered. I thought they weren't doing this as, you know, privateers. They were just trying to share it. So I went on those YouTube videos and I commented. And I said things like, I like to periodically check in here and see, you know, this means the world to me. And I would thank them. Um, and notice that, that that got thousands of likes. Um, and I was just doing it because I wanted these people to know that I was okay with what they were doing. Because I understood their motivation for doing it. Well, this actually got noticed. Here's the front page of Reddit. Good guy game music composer sees his music uploaded on YouTube and doesn't act like a little bitch about it. <laughs> this was literally on the, like, reddit.com. This is the, one of the top trending posts. So, of course, I went on there and I said, well, let me be clear here. And I said what I just said. I don't think people are doing this because they're assholes. I think they're doing it because they are actually loving. Um, well, of course, going on here and noticing, communicating with people like that, well, then this happened. Here was iTunes that week. This is worldwide bestsellers, and you can see Journey ended up 30 against, like, Adele and, oddly enough, Bonnie Raitt. And uh, <laughs> so it was one of those that when people saw, hey, this guy isn't a total ass, or apparently a little bitch, um, <laughs> that made them feel like, you know what, I'm actually going to go buy this album. Uh, it was absolutely amazing, and I always think it's really astonishing what happens when you don't look down on the people that you're hoping will be interested in your product. So back to my little dilemma. Uh, it's obvious that this isn't really a dilemma at all. It's a complete concoction. And uh, if anything, everything that I can, can do to contribute to this incredible art form that I love not only benefits me as a consumer, but it actually creates more opportunities for me within it. So with that bearing in mind, uh, going to my original question, what exactly then is it that I sell um, it's, it's obviously all the things I've been talking about, but it's in a way none of those. Because, you know, the musical notes themselves, the process, the collaboration, uh, the embrace of risk, it's all of that, and yet it never feels satisfying when I ask myself, what, what could it be that it is truly at bedrock on some fundamental level that it is that I'm selling? It's clearly raw magnetic sexuality. <laughs> no, actually, it's something else, uh, and it took me a long time to figure out what I thought it was. In the wake of Journey, there was all this remarkable groundswell, like I said, with the uploading of the video and that sort of thing, but also people started writing testimonials to their experience playing the game. And so what I realized was sometimes when you take big risks, creatively and personally and all that, something like this can happen. Here's something that somebody posted. I'm gonna read this. Somebody on just a random blog wrote Apotheosis, which is the name of the piece of music that I wrote for the finale of the game. They said, never in my life have I listened to a song such as Apotheosis. The first time I listened to it, while reaching the top of the mountain, I had felt such a rush of emotions, my chest felt heavy, and my vision was haunted with the scenery. This combination was such a shock to my senses that whenever I listen to it now, I can't help but cry. Not the sobbing or sniffling kind of cry, but more of the silent kind, where I forget I need to breathe and tears just flow out. I could not describe the emotion I feel when I listen to this song. It's not happiness or sadness, it's not rage or forgiveness, it's not envy or compassion, but if I could try to describe this to you, I would feel like it would be the emotion of knowing I am meant for something, that I have a purpose and a direction in which to go. It's the feeling of knowing you are truly alive, that I have a beating heart and a soul, that I am human, and because I am, I can accomplish great things, that I can create and destroy, I can build bonds or choose to walk away in a different direction, that I'm able to love and be loved, and that I'm able to give life to another. I've never had this happen to me because of a song. Memories of my journey with strangers who I've come to love flash over and over through my mind, mixed in with important events in my life here on this earth, and at the end, all I can see is the light at the top of the mountain, knowing my own real journey is not over. But all I know is that when it is over, whenever that will be, and regardless of my trials or however high that mountain, I will not be finishing it alone. None of us is ever alone. For me, that is what this is actually about. That's what markets are about. That's what art enshrines. And that's what truly, in the end, I think that I'm trying to sell. 
It's about catalyzing a sense of togetherness amongst me and my collaborators, but also amongst me and the potential audience, and the creators in general, the community of creators and audiences. And the more those barriers that separate us dissolve, the more everybody kind of elevates one another. And as idealistic as that sounds, that's what I think markets essentially are an expression of. It's a philosophy rooted very empirically in the real world. In a couple of hours, uh, you'll have a chance to see me and Fee's very own Sean Malone, the mastermind behind things like Out of Frame and a lot of other amazing content online. Um, and the painter you can see here, Angela Bermudez, we are going to explore creativity in this kind of thing live right in front of you at one of the 1145 breakout sessions. The idea is all of us are going to start with a blank canvas and engage in a wordless storytelling together. She will paint, he and I are gonna play, and we're going to just engage with the room. And we have no idea what's going to happen. It's terrifying, it might be a disaster. We'll see. Uh, but I think it takes everything I've been talking about and it distills it into one you know, 30 or 40 minute period that we call dialogos. Um, at the start, I shared with you uh, music from various games of mine, and I'm gonna end with music from one more game. Uh, I was approached by the French company Ubisoft a few years ago to write music for their massively epic, multi-hundred million dollar franchise called Assassin's Creed. And I pitched to them this, in keeping with the scale of that, intimate neoclassical quasi sort of Victorian set of waltzes. Um, and so I will just end by letting you be the judge on if that juxtaposition actually works and if the risks bore fruit. And so with that, thank you for having me. Once more for these guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Very good job. Thank you.